All right, the recording is now started. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, very much excited to be a part of the session delivering the concepts of the blockchain to the young minds this evening as you have all got a forum uh, to learn the lucrative technology at such an early stage. I hope you all are excited as me and I tell it the agenda, keeping in mind that it should reach the audience of all types. So there may be a few participants um, who might already have an experience uh, what blockchain is, and for them, I think this training might uh, sound like a level 1.5, I would say. So which covers the fundamentals and also the foundation concepts a little bit and also on the architecture side. So for the rest, do not worry as I'm going to explain the concepts in the layman terms for easy understanding. So I'll try to make the session as interactive one and also I'll promise you this is going to be an informative one as well, provided if I have all of your participation and attention for the next one and a half. Uh, at the end of the session, you should be familiar with the foundation concepts of the blockchain and also will be able to relate the case studies that you may be experiencing or exploring in the future. All right, so let's start with the agenda. So today we have we'll be covering like what blockchain is an overview and history and the challenges addressed also type of the blockchain, the private, public and permissioned. Ethereum um, in smart contracts, buying and trading Ethereum, Ethereum wallets and token standards as well. And with the Hyperledger fabric, we have the architecture and components and what is the MSP, which is the membership service provider and also the CA certificate authority. Uh, plus, I'll just give you an overview of uh, the framework and also tools of Hyperledger fabric. And with the industry use cases, we're going to talk about the supply chain, how the blockchain uses, you know, how the blockchain works in the government agencies and healthcare and also the Internet of Things. So these are my favorite use cases uh, all the time. If I want to explore uh, some more topics or to develop my area expertise, and this is, I think um, I, I'm going to choose one of them in the future for sure. <laughs> all right. Uh, before I move on, I would like to say, um, ask what is blockchain? Um, to the participants, probably you can, you know, I would I would love to uh, hear from you guys if you already know what blockchain is. If you I, I I'm sure a few of you have, um, you know, might have already explored or know what is the technology all about. And if you don't know the answer, feel free to Google also, <laughs> right? The participation is important. The answer need not be correct. Uh, feel free and uh, type in your comments and I really love to see your participation. I think the group is really silent. <laughs> that is OK, uh, but I'll just go ahead uh, and start. Um, I'll just tell you like uh, in the layman terms, the blockchain and it, it is just an alternative to the traditional database system because of the several technical um, and the security constraints. People prefer to use blockchain for their industry needs, right? So uh, to put it simple, it is a continuously growing a list of records called as blocks and that are linked so that's uh, that's we uh, that uh, that's what we call it as chain and that is secured using the cryptographic hashing techniques the hashing techniques it, it could be be with like a sha1 or md5 or sha256 so these are the most widely used blockchain hashing techniques these days and so the chained blocks are referred to uh, the term blockchain Right, so it also helps providing the distributed immutable ledger, ledger meaning uh, immutable itself. It, it refers to unchangeable. So the record, once you store it in the database, it cannot be changed at all. So it just eliminates the need of central authority by offering sec security and privacy. Central authority here, it refers to an any intermediary person, right? So for example, Consider the current scenario of any financial system, right? The banking system. And if you want to uh, transfer some money to uh, a third party, and you may have to transfer um, and you may have to pay certain fees as a transaction fees, right? So um, the transaction fee may be considered to be very less for an average person for a day to day transactions. But consider uh, what happens to a business transaction, which is uh, amounting to lakhs and crores, right? The transaction fees would be a little higher. 
and it's not just on the financial part but for any goods and services that you may purchase online right and uh, not just online probably in stores uh, for example if you buy an apple as an apple as in fruit right so if you, if you uh, buy an apple uh, for 100 rupees per kg but the actual price of a product from a farmer i think it just would cost less than 25 rupees the all the remaining amount of the charges would go to the middleman who actually takes the product and markets sells rebranding and everything so blockchain itself it's just intended to eliminate all the middleman so in the long run once every uh, once this technology is adopted um, uh, widely i think it it would just eliminate a lot of it would just reduce a, uh, a lot of uh, cost and it would help provide the user the transparency and also let you know where the product comes from and what is the quality of the product and if you want to you know you can just have all the information in one place and if it is just to track with iot you can even uh, you know with the help of the sensor you can just track like we we do have a tracking system only to uh, you know know where the parcel or the courier service is but with the iot implementation with the blockchain i think we, we would um, get to know what the product is and where it comes from and what all the history of the product you know so uh, this is just an example that i can uh, provide so to keep it simple again i just wanted to reiterate so blockchain is just a continuously growing a list of blocks and that are linked together so it is an alternative to a standard traditional database system so in today's world current scenario we will have one server model and all the other nodes or the computers that are connected to the server for example what happens if that particular server goes down right uh, for example it just crashed or hacked or something so all the information will be just gone forever and if there is any restoration point that is already created then it is well and good and sometimes these days the malicious uh, viruses if it just gets attacked to the system i think we may it will be very difficult for an enterprise uh, to retrieve all the information that are lost right so uh, to avoid that or uh, to better use uh, to to uh, uh, um, you know to leverage the technology we have this distributed model the distributed ledger model that comes into picture wherein the servers are connected that is distributed and equally distributed and here we use the peer to peer architecture for the blockchain technologies so um, in here i have provided an um, kind of a, a small diagram for you to understand a graphical representation of what blockchain is you know you know after the session of anybody ask you you can just easily relate it so consider a book right consider a book and uh, so book itself is refers to a blockchain and the pages inside the books are referred to as a block and the entries in the page are referred to as the transaction blockchain transaction that are linked so for example uh, probably in, in in another words if you want to submit or if you want to store any data to a database a standard database you just type directly um, you know you just store the information directly to the server but in the blockchain server blockchain uh, ledger i would say it's not a server we say it as a ledger it's a it, it's just a book or a ledger of transactions so uh, blockchain transaction itself a packaged into a blocks and that packaged blocks will be linked to the chain of blocks as in the blockchain itself so uh, this is a, a kind of a basic uh, graphical representation it it will be easy for you to you know relate it i believe uh, after the session um, it will be um, helpful for you uh, to uh, keep a note of it i think uh, probably to move on you know uh, uh, and move further what is blockchain and what is the architecture of the blockchain i believe it is equally important to know where the blockchain technology itself comes into picture so it it, it is not such one such technology that comes into uh, use all of a sudden but we do have a very impressive you know, bitcoin has a technology 
that is based out of blockchain. So uh, industry experts found out that you know blockchain has a capability outside of a Bitcoin usage, and then uh, makes few modification and altered it according to the industry use cases. So start with the history, you know blockchain history. Um, so uh, to give an overview, probably to uh, before the DigiCash, I would like to tell that industries and the business transactions um, was very inefficient earlier and also very cost um, expensive and also vulnerable through security threat and also the trust is a very critical factor that was very challenging and time and cost are the driving business decisions right for any uh, any projects that you work on for any industry models that you are in for any business that you may go know uh, create or operate in future so what are the uh, three things that you keep it in mind the time you know, if you if you are committing a certain time period to your client and your customer that you will be delivering a product. So you have to do it. You have to maintain the time and also the quality. Right. And also it just we have to keep the keep in mind about the cost so that it will profit both the business and also the customers. And it should not be too expensive and it should not just, uh, you know, if you are using the technology or if your business is based out of uh, complete technology, a web technology or a cloud based. So the security threat and also the um, kind of a, hack i think a lot of a lot of you people have already heard about a lot of cyber attacks you know the security threats that has been happening in the financial system not just financial system it's just a ha it can happen to any any uh, business scenario for that matter so uh, keeping in mind that uh, you know the blockchain i think we can uh, we can address majority of the challenges that are existing in the today's world so that's when um, keeping all this in mind, the industry experts and also the technologies, the computer scientists. So they have um, come up with a few technologies, you know, ensuring the anonymous transactions and the electronic money funding. So that's when it came, you know, uh, DigiCash uh, Digi comes into picture. It was founded in 1989 by David. So he's also an American count, uh, computer scientist and also a crypto a cryptographer. So that's why he just got an idea. OK, instead of just, you know, sending a transaction from one party to another, for example, if somebody hacks your system, Right. If it is a very critical business proposal that a party A, person A and the uh, person A wants to send to person B, what what if a third party or a competitor hacks your system and know what you're dealing about? So that's a threat, right? So your your business proposal will be like it, it will be totally collapsed. So the tomorrow that you can imagine, like you have already imagined, will no longer be yours. So in it, it's if if it is a smaller project, it is well and good, and like it's we are we are pretty much on a safer side. But for a huge critical project, it's going to make a huge impact and also would cost an employment of a lot of employees. Right. So that's when they have uh, found out, OK, let us try the anonymous transactions. So if I wanted to send some information from one person to another or probably a money funding, for example, if you are uh, transacting, you know, 10,000 rupees from person A to person B, you are relying on a bank today and you will be paying some transaction fee and service charges you it may not happen or it, you may not be uh, paying for every transaction but it will be calculated annually right so electronic money funding if they just used a uh, blind signature and uh, what uh, david thought is that you know by introducing a new mechanism called blind signature which plays a vital role in assuring the transaction and we can just make it very anonymous way you will not disclose your identity, but the transaction itself, it will just go through very safely. So that's when DigiCash uh, comes into picture and it's all, um, I think it started in 1989. And after that, uh, we have this hash cash. Like it's uh, it's founded in 1997. Again, it's an email system. So I have, as I've mentioned earlier, there are two, uh, two uh, concepts. One is the digital message, you know, transferring from party A to party B. And the second one is the money transfer. So you don't want your information to be tampered in between or you don't want your information to be altered in between. So what Hashcash uh, founder Adam Back uh, decided that, you know, uh, to uh, identify 
the spam emails and also to address the DVoS attacks, which means the denial of service attack itself. So they use a pre proof of work system um, algorithm and also uh, used a you know a hashing um, subject line. I mean the email of the subject itself. It contains a lot of key value pairs and also uh, contains the hashing of the message. If you find if the recipient finds any message to be altered, they will get to know you know this is not the same message that a person B, you know, a person A or the sender who actually sent it. So if if they find or if they just validate using the blind signature or the, I mean, not the blind signature, uh, but if they just decrypt the message, they will anyways get to know that if it is altered or not. So that's how the hash cash works. And followed that, we have B money in picture. So this is in the year 1998. And also an early age distributed cash system. It is proposed by Vedai. So it's very important. This particular B money plays a very important role, um, you know, on the blockchain technologies as in the evaluation of the blockchain technologies, I would say. And wherein it just operated based on a distributed caching system, where which uses the digital aliases and also the anonymous distributed electronic cash system. So this, I thought it was assumed that, um, you know, the digital aliases, I believe, uh, will be able to send and receive money through a decentralized network and also to ensure the implementation of the contracts among themselves. Contract as in I'm referring to any business rules or any terms and conditions between two parties. So without any involvement of a third party like a bank or an auditor or any kind of a legal person for that matter. So B money project unfortunately did not move after the implementation of the white paper, but then we have the E gold. So this company was already introduced or founded in the year 1996, but the adoption was after the B money and that's that's the reason I've just put the E gold after B money. So it's based out of, you know, uh, it's based of the concept of transacting the precious metals such as silver, gold or any any diamonds or any precious metals uh, that you can think of. But mostly predominantly they have used gold and silver to transact between one parties to another. Right. So uh, because that that has been most widely used and most acceptable uh, by the world population. So they have used, you know, what will happen, right? If you transact gold and silver online. <laughs> so a lot of security attacks and a lot of uh, digital scams and cyber attacks happened. And unfortunately, e-gold um, could not, um, you know, survive the uh, a picture so they just have to drop or like it's not like they have to drop it's completely um, they, they were in a loss so they could not move further and then we have bit golden picture so wherein it is also based on the concept of exchange of money and and also that it's based off uh, the decentralized and also distributed system so this is uh, this company is founded by 1980 1998 um it's it's uh, the founder of the bit gold is nick sabo right nick sabo and bit gold and bitcoin technologies or the bitcoin uh, protocols or how bitcoin operates are pretty similar and so uh, what happens is that people um, tend to think that uh, nick sabo is the actual founder of bitcoin and they have a lot of uh, legal um, proceedings um, start against Nick Sabo, but that's not the actual case. But then it's operated on a digital uh, a decentralized distributed system instead of a centralized authority controlling the entire system. So now we have the hero of the picture uh, Bitcoin, uh, which uses the blockchain technology. Right. So this is again uh, aiming in terms of uh, generating the transactions and operating based on P2P eCash, as in peer to peer eCash, online cash, electronic caching system. Uh, apart from all of this, Bitcoin just uses all the uh, technologies, all the concepts of um, the previous organizations, whatever they have found, decentralized, distributed, anonymous, distributed, address DYS attacks, ensure their anonymous transaction along with providing value distribution and also consensus so that's that's strong that's how strong the blockchain technology is so bitcoin is based out of blockchain technology but bitcoin is not actually the blockchain so bitcoin uses 
the blockchain. So that's the underlying technology behind Bitcoin. So it's very uh, important for you to know uh, what happens because it's not one single technology just appears all of a sudden. But you know, uh, you understand. In of course, the necessity is the mother of invention, right? So when we have to spend a lot of uh, money, when we have to go through a lot of legal proceedings, I think uh, we tend to think of an alternative means, and blockchain is, uh, is one such things that we have right now. But Bitcoin it just uses the public anonymous. So industry experts thought the public anonymous won't work for their business models, but instead we'll just tweak the technology as a little bit and turn into uh, the way that how the in industry or the enterprise needed as in if I am a part of an organization and if you are all a part of the same organization, I want to know what you're doing right as a business uh, owner and also a project manager. I want to know what are the operation that is going on? What are the transaction that is processing? So it is important for me to know the identity of the user who's taking part. So that's when the public anonymous turns into private permission or the um, you know the identity points comes into picture. I'll just take you to uh, those points in a little you know in a few more minutes. But yes, uh, these are the challenges in the uh, existing system as in the client server model, which is you know the launching the remote process for any any uh, works that you see. For example, I have sent a meeting link to you guys, so I have uh, organized a meeting for example, and if you guys wanted to uh, attend the same thing, you just have to launch a certain application from your end basically launching the remote process without me actually I, i'm not there it's just all virtual but i just wanted to uh, you know uh, operate something virtually so it's important for me to operate something something virtually because that's what we have been doing uh, these days so launching remote process and communicate with another one another so what happens if multiple systems are connecting you are able to you know operate one system but you are not able to connect or communicate with another system so that's going to be a challenge right and also if everybody for example if you are all if if all of the participants like 30 50 participants if we are all working on a, a single project for Savita University, then we just have to keep the same data in sync across multiple as in like we just have to keep the same data in sync and all your applications only then you will be able to see what is the current changes that is going on. What is the current update that you can expect and what is the next? Uh, 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 what is the next process or what are the next steps that are going to take taken by the um, industries or uh, the institution itself for that matter? And also you know, it's just not only to t uh, keep track or uh, not only to uh, see what is uh, there in the system, but if you wanted to put something into the place and if you wanted to put your ideas into picture, then you need to collaborate right together. You just have to communicate with me and you just have to put your thoughts and update something and I'll be able to know it all requires a collaboration. So uh, that is how it works. It's it's not it, I'm just putting in a very uh, simple terms, but uh, just consider about the industry systems, right? So launching the remote process and communicate with one another. For example, if I'm just working here, it's all work from home environment. If I want to operate something which can be operated in a uh, secured place. I can just operate the same or I can just work the same scenario being at home using the virtual desktop, which is launching the remote process. And if I just, uh, you know, want to navigate something, I really wanted to communicate with the system. And if I wanted to keep the data in sync with the multiple location, for example, if I wanted to access the same virtual desktop, but on a different computer laptop, it is imper important and also to collaborate effectively. And also if, if, if I wanted to share the same data to my lead or my boss, then he has to put in his comments and also to share the key insights to the business stakeholders. So uh, you know, understand how how important it is and how important um, you know for us to address these challenges. It is not always possible for an industry. It is okay for a small team 
you know like for an individual organization like us as in um, for a small group like a 50 people like uh, we are on the call today uh, but then what happens if an organization has a multiple entities for example the organization that i work on i'm working for legato health technologies which is an affiliate to the uh, elevans health so it has a lot of entities within them right it has a lot of entities within them and if if something you know uh, comes into picture and if some business rules is being set into a uh, place that needs to be that needs to be propagated or cascaded to all the affiliates um, of the elevans health so uh, it it will be challenging for a huge organization like that so it is very important for us to uh, you know address these challenges i'll just talk about it in a, a little uh, bit after explaining the architecture of uh, the blockchain right <clears throat> so for example an user if you, if if kartika or if shiny wants to request for a transaction transaction as in like you know uh, to keep it simple like if you, if they wanted to add any data to the database right so they just uh, gonna uh, send a request that i want to submit this data i want to store this data into the blockchain so what what happens the system in the back end is that so that data itself is going to package into a container called block and that block is going to you know uh, submit to the network of nodes and that's when the validation happens it's not something that whatever the data submitted by shiny or kartika is going to be added to the blockchain but that will be validated so it's going to be validated like whether it is uh, you know whether it follows organization structure whether it follows uh, terms and conditions that is defined for that projects or for the organization so all the validation checks needs to be done and once it is uh, once everything is just clear once everything is um, looks good it then provides a sign off right it then it just uh, provide the signature that it is valid the transaction is now valid you just can you know go submit your transaction to the blockchain so that's when here the network of nodes validates the transaction and the transaction is going to submitted and to cascade it to all the other networks for example if shiny as i've mentioned earlier um, if one of the participants from the group is going to submit a uh, data so it's not just one person signature is required but all of the authoring uh, author authoring uh, peers or the authoring network signature is imperative to uh, you know uh, to allow the transaction to the blockchain so if for example if 50 members are the part of a group and if a participant um, a is submitting a transaction so there will be a, there is a business rule that is said that at least 20 out of 30 participants needs to be verified and provide an approval to validate or add it to the blockchain so if i receive 20 signature i then consider it to be valid then all the 10 remaining 10 people need to approve automatically they they do not have any option to approve or reject even though they do they do not have that privileges right so once i receive once that particular transaction received 20 signature as per the protocol or as per the terms and conditions defined then that particular transaction is considered to be valid and then the transaction or the data copy is automatically added to their copy of the blockchain so here uh, once it is completed the ledger is now updated with the data and the user who's who initially submitted the request uh, will receive a verification or will, will receive a confirmation that the transaction is now complete so this is the overall picture and whatever the scenario that you think of in the blockchain technologies it just operates in a similar way so we have a different technologies inside the blockchain which is ethereum and hyperledger fabric and r3 corda uh, etc but then everything almost everything it just operates in the same similar model so this is the underlying architecture that you can think of or you can just have it for your reference and the rest of the technologies follows a similar manner I hope uh, this makes sense. And having that said, 
um, the blockchain technologies, you know, uh, now the uh, now the web application, as I've just mentioned, the web application, you can think of any web application of your choice has become very challenging to access stored data with an effective way, right? It uses the end tier for the faster response, but the blockchain itself, as I mentioned earlier, it uses a peer to peer. So peer to peer as in here, the network of nodes. So uh, I, I've been consistently using the word network of nodes a lot of times. So what what uh, the network of nodes is actually uh, refers to, right? So it's just a computer system. For example, if you if if you all have the computer system, if you are operating on one machine and if another participant is using another machine, but it is linked to a same blockchain. So that is why we as uh, we, we call it as nodes network of nodes. It, it's all forming a network, right? So the system or a block or peer, I mean not block, a system or a peer or a node, it's all refers to a same similar meaning. So you don't have to confuse yourself. It's just a terminology that is different, but the concept is just the same. If I am operating something, if I just type a data in my computer and once the transaction is valid, if I add it to a blockchain, then uh, the, the same copy of the data will be, you know, propagated and cascaded to all the other computers that are linked to the same blockchain. So that's how it works. So with the blockchain, we are, um, you know, we have the following um, challenges that are addressed as I've provided on the deck, uh, which is the, um, you know, launching the remote process. Okay, by launching the remote process, this particular point, launching the remote process and communicating with one another, I think it's not not really required because uh, we are already connecting. You know, the computer computer and the nodes are already connected within the blockchain system itself. So the, you can just strike off the very first point, first to two points, and keeping the same data in sync across the multiple location. Oh yes. So here there is no node that is greater than any other node. If I have 30 systems that is connected to a blockchain network. Here, all the nodes carry or all the nodes are, are of uh, having the same similar privileges. No node is superior and no uh, node is inferior, right? So all the participants or all the systems or all the nodes who, who, which is participating in a network, it's all treated in the same way. Just that few people as in few systems or few nodes may have a higher privileges. Um, you know, uh, of course, that can be uh, managed based on the permissions that is provided. I'll just cover it uh, during um, the, I think, the next session that we have, I mean, the next topic that we have for Ethereum and Hyperledger Fabric. I'll just cover that a little bit more um, on that particular section. So here, the keeping the data in sync in the blockchain, it just allows the user to add the data, but by not tampering any old ones. Right. So current uh, database system, uh, if you consider any, you know, any data that you have entered, it just operates or it just uses the CRUD model. CRUD as in C for create, R for read, U for update and D for delete. So this CRUD model is for the existing database. So you can create and if you want to alter, you can just alter the data. And if you do not want the data at all, you can just go simply delete it. That will be permanently deleted. And if you have the restoration point, that's a, another topic. That's a different story. Let's not talk about that. But this uh, existing database is uh, simple. Standard database uh, model just follow the CRUD model. But in the blockchain, it just uses only create and read. There is no delete at all. There is no update at all. So the data once stored will be there in the blockchain forever, right? So by using that, by using um, a blockchain, you know, we can use the same data in sync because of course we cannot delete or we cannot alter it. Anyways, the same data will be updated in all of the systems. Hence the immutability is addressed by keeping the copy of all the data that is stored in the uh, blockchain. So immut immutability, if you can recollect, it's it is referring to unchangeable. You cannot change any data that is stored in the blockchain. To, so uh, in order to <coughs> collaborate effectively, excuse me, Sorry for that. In order to collaborate effectively and also make the system work together, the blockchain should have or the blockchain just follow the consensus and the smart contracts. 
Uh, consensus and the smart contracts is a new terminology or a uh, new phrase for you guys, but I'll just tell you what the consensus is and through the blockchain addressed, you know, blockchain, the, the following challenges are addressed as highly secure. It's very much secure. You cannot just alter the data and there is no cyber attacks. And uh, even though they perform, the chances to attack a blockchain is very, very less. So I'll tell you why by providing a sample blockchain demo at the end of the hyperledger fabric and you will get to know why I'm, uh, why the blockchain is highly secure and robust and if you want to verify and if you want to audit who is processed what if this is again it's it's for the industry use cases i'm talking about i'm not talking about the public blockchain which is anonymous so confidentiality and integrity that is maintained and data visibility and openness and no intermediaries no intermediaries at all because with the help of the smart contracts you can just define your own terms and conditions if you wanted to write any business logic for example if i'm if i have started a company and if i'm just owning a company and if i want a certain uh, business sector to operate in a certain model i'll just set some rules and protocols for them to follow right in without blockchain i'll be relying on a person to incorporate all those measures, incorporate all those protocols, and I'll just keep a tab. I'll just keep an update or get an update from that intermediary person to know what is going on. But with the blockchain, you just define your same terms and conditions, but in a programmable format. The system do it for you automatically in the back end. So I'll just come to that. So that's that's the that's what the smart contracts refers to. With the smart contracts, you don't have to have this, uh, you know, you don't have to have the um, intermediaries or any middleman. So the key concepts before we move further for the blockchain, I think it's important for you to know what consensus is, what uh, the proof of work and proof of stake is a power of consensus mechanism again. So uh, and what the smart contracts is and what is mining. So here's this my sample block and I have provided. And I'm going to uh, play a sample blockchain demo. I think I I think I should uh, open it probably after, you know, explaining all of this. Uh, one moment. So uh, so I, I've been using a lot of uh, times, you know, the term blocks and blockchain. You, you may be uh, wondering like what uh, uh, the block is, you know, what are the components that are there in the block? So any blocks that you see, you know, it, it, it's just basically a container. It's just basically a node that is um, a package together with your data. For example, if I want to submit a data into the blockchain, so it will be packaged automatically, right? It's not uh, something that is automatically added to the blockchain, but it will be initially form a block and uh, contain, you know, block version. What is the block version? And Merkle tree root hash and block or, or previous block hash. As in, the, it just uses the cryptographic hashing mechanism and n bits, nonce, and timestamp. So, if I just go deep into every terminologies that you are seeing on the screen, it's gonna take a lot of time, and also it's gonna be a lot more confusing itself. So, rather, I would just wanted this se session to be on a more foundational uh, level uh, to cover just the fundamentals. So, for, for now, just take a look at what are the components um, are there inside a block. Right, the transaction counter itself, it just has the number of transactions. You you need not submit one single data. You can just submit any data, you know, any number of data, and in any format. So, for example, if if um, uh, if you wanted to submit anything, um, if a field that is uh, that is created or configured in a string format, you just have to submit a data only in a string format. Right, and that is not uh, like that field will not be. Um, uh, I think that field will not permit any integer or in any number format or any special character for that matter. But in blockchain, you can just add any type of data, and you can even store the documents also, files, zip files, videos, and anything like you know. Think of NFTs, the non fungible tokens, and these is it's a lot. It 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 is too. Um, it, it's it's uh, uh, a lot of uh, NFTs are there in place, and people are talking about it, and also most widely using uh, about it. Right. So uh, you can just uh, trans. I mean, package all the transaction. All the data, in other words, and what is the time of the uh, data that you are submitting? 
and nonce is one such uh, component in a block it's just making the miner or the hacker difficult uh, to open and see or you know decrypt and uh, see what is the data that you have submitted to the blockchain and also merkle tree root hash is the um, component refers to the hashing of the data itself so it just uh, hash all of your um, you know the data and also the timestamp and what is the block number and along with the previous block hash so it's it's very very difficult for um, you to alter anything so i when i just provide a sample blockchain demo you will get to know a far more a clearer understanding so here you know the genesis block for any blockchain if you think of any blockchain you think of a very first block will be a genesis block right and if you are creating a blockchain you can anybody can create a blockchain anybody can create a blockchain whether it is for your your own use or for your organization use or for your institution use for anything for anything you can just use a uh, you can create a blockchain at initially what uh, uh, before submitting anything to the blockchain so the very important key factor key component is that the genesis block that comes into picture where it contains the rules of all the uh, you know uh, blocks or the network itself so who can join the network and who can have what privileges and how the system should operate right and under what scenario a transaction can be considered as valid and who all, who 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 are the participants can approve a transaction or validate a transaction or provide a signature or a sign off to a transaction so everything everything will be um, updated in the genesis block so it's very important and this is uh, this is uh, the master of all you know uh, it just contains uh, the information of all the uh, admin privileges or the network configuration settings and things like that so the very first block once it is added to the blockchain it just contains the hash of the previous block and then comes the data and the uh, entire nonce and also the hash of the previous data along with the data that you have submitted is then hashed to a um you know uh, sh using the sh256 uh, algorithm it just a hash and that will be submitted to the second blockchain so in order to modify the second block for example it contains the hash of the previous block which is the first block and if you alter anything that's going to change the third block also and the subsequent blocks whatever it is created so once you hack the system you know once you're trying to act hack the system the moment you try to hack the system a lot of transactions that has been added to the system which makes the job more uh, very much difficult so i would say it, we can hack the um, blockchain network but it is very impossible i i i'm not saying that we cannot i am not saying that it is not um, it's it's not uh, that it is impossible at all just that it makes the job very difficult and by the time that you are doing all the uh, nasty things in terms of you know hacking and altering any data uh, the older or the newer block blocks comes into picture and uh, the copy of the new data will automatically update to all this network of nodes so whatever the job or whatever the work that you have done to uh, tamper the data it just goes in vain right so that's how it works so proof of work is something okay before i move on i think it's important for you to know what consensus and the smart contract is and also what uh, mining is right so consensus is a mechanism that uh, you know in the, that is in the blockchain at least the blockchain front it's a mechanism uh, to ensure all the network of nodes all the participants or all the systems are in sync and also to agree on which transaction are valid and which transactions can be added to the blockchain consensus this particular uh, concepts or this uh, particular um, functionality it just assure that uh, protocols or the terms and conditions that you defined it, it it ensure that these rules are being followed and guarantee that all the transactions or all the data that you are going to submit in the future it's it's just uh, you know uh, it's valid and these terms and conditions are followed in place
So that's the main purpose of consensus that we have it in the blockchain. So you don't have to put any governance mechanism. So consensus itself acts as a governance mechanism. Act, you know, ensure that all the transactions are valid and ensure that all the participants in the network are following the terms and conditions that we are defined. And uh, consensus again uh, has these uh, two algorithms, you know, which is most widely used in the blockchain, which is proof of work and also proof of stakes. It's a part of consensus mechanism. So the reason that I have provided in the separate pointer is that it's going to be most widely used. And uh, this is something that we are going to cover in the next two topics that we're going to cover, which is Ethereum and Hyperledger Fabric. So uh, what happens if I submitted data? To a blockchain right so i i do not have a permission to um, update it for example it's i'm just talking about a public blockchain here like bitcoin so if you just uh, put something there it is not added to the blockchain immediately it requires a miner to come in and then that miner miner as in uh, who mines the data and add the block to the blockchain so they will just take a fees of a transaction or uh, you they will just receive a transaction uh, what, what we call as a, a prize maybe as a, a reward yeah that's the right word uh, as a block reward so in the bitcoin if somebody is um, uh, purchasing something or if, if somebody is uh, you know trading something that's not added to a blockchain automatically it requires a miner to add a blockchain i mean add that particular data to the blockchain so for any blocks that needs to be mined initially so the miner will take about you know 12.5 bitcoin per block just imagine the number of you know amount of money amount of reward that they are going to get so you use your computational power that you are using a lot of work to be uh, put uh, put in there and then uh, as an as a, a prize or as a reward for that um, effort that you that the blockchain or the bitcoin itself is going to pay you 12.5 btc so that's how, and now it's it just got reduced for every 8 years it's going to reduce by half so it's going to be like it was 6.25 and that just got reduced to like 3.15 or something and then now for every 8 years i believe it's just going to decrease so that that's how it works so proof of work is something for a, any block it, in order to mine it they need to miner need to solve a consensus problem you know it just operate either in a proof of work mechanism or proof of stake proof of work as in like if if you wanted to uh, put a block in a blockchain you just have to you know uh, solve a, a complex mathematical puzzle like you know finding the nonce is that mathematical puzzle so nothing uh, bigger you know uh, like you know just think of a lot of scientific uh, uh, what is that formulas things like that but it's just to remember or just to identify the nonce but it requires a lot of effort but to identify one nonce they have to burn a lot of computational power and energy resources you know electricity that that comes into picture so proof of work it just eats a lot of energy but then it just gives a lot of reward too and proof of stake is something that miner who can participate in the mining today in the current um, ethereum it just recently uh, shifted the consensus mechanism to proof from proof of work to proof of stake and that uh, expects whoever the mining miner is expects the uh, miner to hold the maximum or the majority of the stake or the wealth of the ethereum blockchain if they have a lot number of uh, you know uh, ethereum if they own a lot of ethereum assets then they can then they are eligible to participate or then they are eligible to mine a block so that is how it works but of course it it, it reduces a lot of effort in terms of uh, computational energy but you have to spend money in terms of buying assets so that's the minor difference. Anyways, it requires a lot of cost, but then uh, proof of work, it considerably reduces a lot of uh, significant energy.
So uh, smart contracts, when it comes into picture, to put it in a simple terms, what smart contract is, it's just a set of rules and um, you know terms and conditions. For example, as I mentioned earlier, if a business needs to operate, every business has some uh, terms and conditions, right? If you purchase a product, you may see the terms and conditions apply. Nobody, nobody would just you know highlight that terms and condition, but anyways, you will see a small asterisk. You know that will covers comes with a lot of pages and pages. And you have to read through. So nobody will do that. As in, like very few. Not I would say I would not say like nobody. With very few, I think it is very important to know as a system and also for the industry business model. It's very important to know what the terms and conditions are. And smart contracts inside the blockchain it really helps to define what what the terms and conditions are. And we are just defining the same uh, the terms and conditions. You know, in a programmable language. Current scenario, we are defining the terms and conditions probably in a documented format, right? And if you are applying for a loan, for example, and if you are applying for or if you are opening a bank account, for I think everybody would have done that. If you are opening a bank account, even if the bank account has certain terms and conditions, so what are the terms and conditions? You may be um, seeing it, you know, in the documented format, or if the process is online, you will see the same uh, documented format, but in the uh, electronic uh, on the electronic device, right? So in the uh, smart contract or in the blockchain itself, those. Uh, conditions. I mean, the terms and conditions are in a programmable format and feed it into will feed into the blockchain. So they will uh, th that will automatically execute and validate whether everything, all the transactions, mean uh, you know performed as per the rules defined. So I've been talking a lot. I think um, I think it's very uh, important for you also to know how the blockchain itself looks like. I'll just provide a sample um, demo. So based on the concepts that I have just explained earlier, and let's see how it works. And this is again, it's a very, very basic model. Don't think that this is all blockchain about uh, blockchain is all about, but this is just an UI level, right? A lot of things going on in the back end and um, uh, for any blockchain, you need an uh, UI, you know, to operate from the end user perspective and a client application, right? Uh, to transact and also a server. And also, you know, the network based model is it, 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 blockchain is not one uh, technology that uh, it's all about UI, but it's, it's it's just a lot more than that. So uh, now we have this um, sample demo and initially just con consider this is a Genesis block and see this Genesis block that I have told you that it contains a lot of, you know, um, what is that network configuration business rules and things like that and you see the previous block or uh, hash is zero because there is no previous block because this is a very first block like block zero it's not block one but it's block zero and you see the small number here this is a nonce and in order to find that the miner will not be know uh, will not get to know the nonce value but they will just you know identify by pro uh, solving the complex mathematical puzzle and identify what the nonce range value is not the exact value but the range value would be so the nonce would just vary for every single data that you feed in so let's just type for example i'm going to type a test data i'm going to click on add new block okay so now once i hit the uh, add new block button the data itself it just added to the blockchain automatically. So there is no miner here. There is no miner here. It's just for the test purpose. But in the actual scenario, your data will just, uh, you know, package into a block and then expect a miner to add it to the blockchain because it requires a person to, you know, come and add and then validate everything. They just do the validation stuff and then add it to the blockchain. So I'm going to create another one, test two, another one. Oops, I'm going to. I think I'm I'm trying to modify the existing one in which the blockchain is not allowing. That's OK. Uh, that's what is expecting expected functionality too. So let's say let's we have five blocks in total. OK. So for example, OK, let's see this is a chain of blocks now. Block zero and block one and block two and block three and block four five and you see the previous block hash, I mean the Genesis block hash is, you know, uh, ending with B37CF. 
and that block hash is now added to the second block or the block that you are trying to add 3c uh, 37cf you just compare both it the both the hashes are same and the here again to in order to compute this particular block one hash it's going to take both the data and also the previous block and also the timestamp comes in the picture and then hash everything you know and if i just try to change a small uh, data over here for example 20 okay um it's just a one single uh, number that i have added here like i just change the test 2 to test 20 and see what happens to the remaining blocks everything is being highlighted in red meaning that any one single change any small change in the input it would just change the total you know the it would just change the output value as well if you change the input it will have a tremendous effect in the output so it's also called as avalanche effect so uh, this is how it works. So ensure that the, for any hashing or the cryptographic algorithms, you do not, you, you should not be changing any inputs. Or if you want to decrypt anything using this particular hash, it should just provide, or it will always provide the same set of input that you have just provided, right? As a sender or as, as a receiver, if you are trying to decrypt this particular hash value, then you will get to know what are the data that it contains and what are the data that it is used to hash this value. Previous hash, data and timestamp, everything. So in order to fix that, and we have this sample demo, like you know, the fix button, and it'll just automatically fix that. And we have to fix that. And think of think of the minor I mean not the minor, think of a hacker. Like, you know, the moment I just try to um, alter anything and the because I'm not adding anything, uh, because I'm just using this blockchain only myself. And what about if it is open to public, right? If it is open to everybody in the world and they just keep adding the data and sometimes what happens if I wanted to change something over here and it will just uh, tremendously uh, affect every everything like it just uh, uh, affect all the consequent blocks here added to the blockchain so uh, the moment they uh, uh, try to fix everything you the the, the hacker will have hundred or thousands new blocks that is already added to the blockchain and he, he is expected to fix everything before the next blocks that is getting added otherwise the uh, data whatever it is already updated or whatever the uh, the, uh, the tampering work that he has done done it will automatically update it to the actual data so everything is going to update to the same old or revert back to the original data so in other words so it's very it's it's kind of um, possible but it's very difficult to change so that's why we we say it as you know tamper evident so uh, this is all about uh, this um, uh, you know the demo that I have provided and blockchain itself the type of blockchain itself we have uh, three types public private and permissioned and public is something that a bitcoin operates you know it's it's just open to public and can be accessible by everybody and there is no permission and even one of your one of the participants uh, in the in our sessions if you wanted to try and add something into a bitcoin as in like if you wanted to uh, purchase something that that blockchain would allow there is no permissions there is no uh, security privileges that set so it's completely anonymous and even if you try to uh, make any transactions is going to be completely anonymous like the identity will not be disclosed and we have the security mechanisms of uh, for the public um, blockchains namely you know the proof of work and proof of stake and by now you will get to have some idea what pow and pos is and the transaction speed is very very slow and the private and permissions just operate in a very very similar manner just that private is very suitable for one single entity wherein permission is for multiple selected organization for example as i've told already elevans health is an organization that has a lot of affiliates and uh, if they wanted to use a blockchain i would recommend a permission rather than private private as in like is just one entity but the affiliates I, do, I cannot add but with a permission model i can add multiple selected different organization and also give them the privileges to operate in my blockchain as well so that's the whole difference between private and permission and here we have the known identities in a corporate in an industry model it is very important to know who is operating and who is doing what 
right so we are giving the permission to them and also restrict them with the special privileges and pre approved pa participants and it is very lighter and faster and if they want to operate in a voting based consensus they can do so so um it, rather than giving a lot of lectures and a lot of uh, hours to talk about it i thought a quick video for you to understand you know what the blockchain is um, i think one moment i have a quick uh, video for you to play Ever wonder if there's an easier way to complete transactions without having to deal with online wallets, banks, and third-party applications? Well, it's possible thanks to blockchain. Here's everything you need to know about blockchain. Imagine four friends, Jack, Ted, Sam, and Phil meet up for dinner. After they're done, Jack pays the bill, and all of them decide to split the expense amongst each other. Now, on the next day, when Phil sends his share to Jack via online money transfer, the transaction goes through without a hitch. Then, Ted and Sam send their respective shares to Jack, but their transactions don't go through. The failed transaction cites some issues at the bank. That's when Jack comes to know about the many ways a bank transaction could fail. It could be due to technical issues at the bank, one of their accounts were hacked, daily transfer limits being exceeded, and sometimes additional charges, like transfer charges associated with transferring money. To solve these problems, the concept of cryptocurrency came into existence. Cryptocurrencies are a form of digital or virtual currency that run on a technology known as blockchain. Thanks to blockchain, cryptocurrencies are immune to counterfeiting, don't require a central authority, and are protected by strong and complex encryption algorithms. And in a market of more than thousands of cryptocurrencies like Litecoin, Ethereum, Zcash, and so on, one reigns supreme, Bitcoin. Now, let's go back to our previous example and have Phil, Ted, and Sam send Jack two Bitcoins each as their contribution to the previous night's dinner. Let's assume Phil, Ted, and Sam have three Bitcoins in reserve, while Jack has five. First, Phil sends two Bitcoins to Jack. A record is created in the form of a block. The transaction details between them is permanently inscribed in this block. This record also holds the number of Bitcoins each of the friends own. So, after Phil's transaction, Jack has seven Bitcoins, while Phil has one. Following this, Sam and Ted send two Bitcoins to Jack. A new block is created for each of these transactions. These blocks hold the transaction details as well as how many Bitcoins Sam, Ted, and Jack have in reserve. These blocks are linked to each other, as each of them takes reference from the previous one for the number of Bitcoins each friend owns. This chain of records, or blocks, is called a ledger, and this ledger is shared among all the friends, which acts as a public distributed ledger. This forms the basis of blockchain. So, what happens when Phil has only one Bitcoin left, and he tries to send two more Bitcoins to Jack? The transaction will not go through. This is because all his friends have copies of the ledger, and it's clear that Phil has only one Bitcoin left. His friends will flag this transaction as invalid. A hacker will not be able to alter the data in the blockchain because each user has a copy of the ledger. The data within the blocks are encrypted by complex algorithms. All of this is made possible with the help of blockchain technology. Blockchain can be described as a collection of records linked with each other strongly resistant to alteration, and protected using cryptography. Now, let's have a closer look at the Bitcoin transaction between Jack and Phil and find out how it works. Every user in the Bitcoin network has two keys, a public key and a private key. The public key is an address that everyone in the network knows of, like an email address of a user. The private key is a unique address that only the user has knowledge of, something like a password. First, Phil passes the number of Bitcoins he wants to send to Jack, along with his and Jack's unique wallet address through a hashing algorithm. All of this is part of the transaction details. These details are encrypted using encryption algorithms and using Phil's unique private key. This is done to digitally sign the transaction and to indicate that the transactions came from Phil. This output is now transmitted across the world using Jack's public key. 
With this, the message or transaction can be decrypted only by Jack's private key, which only Jack has knowledge of. Different cryptocurrencies use different hashing algorithms. While Bitcoin uses the SHA-256 algorithm, Ethereum, which is also a famous cryptocurrency, uses one known as Ethash. This transaction and several other similar ones are taking place all around the world. These transactions are validated and then added block by block. The people who validate these blocks are called miners. For a block to be validated and added to a blockchain, miners need to solve a complex mathematical problem. The miner who solves this first adds the block to the blockchain and is rewarded with 12.5 bitcoins. The process of solving the complex mathematical problem is called proof of work, and the process of adding a block to the blockchain is called mining. With this, Phil and Jack's wallets are updated, just like every person in the network who has completed a transaction. Now that you know about blockchain and its important concepts, time for a small quiz. What is the concept of having to deal with online all right, I think uh, we can stop. I believe uh, the session or the uh, video that I have shared is uh, informative. Uh, so there is a lot of there are a lot of videos that are available online uh, which talks about Bitcoin, blockchain, what Ethereum and Hyperledger fabric is, right? So uh, let's move on and explore a little bit on the blockchain technologies, right? We have explored the type of blockchains as in like public, private and permissioned. Right? These are the types of blockchain wherein we have the types of blockchain technologies. Now we are moving to blockchain technologies. So public, private and permissions are blockchain types and Ethereum and Hyperledger Fabric or Tricorder. So these are the uh, examples of blockchain technologies. So um, we have uh, the, uh, so I have, I've just uh, handpicked two uh, uh, blockchain technologies which is commonly used, you know, and also in the industry um, wise. So which is like um, I think the very first one is Ethereum. So which is the base of uh, it just follows the Bitcoin protocol and Bitcoin uh, algorithm. Um, and just they tweaked a little bit, you know, it's it's founded by uh, Vitalik Buterin and it's it just operate based on permissioned model. So it's just operating based on um i think it's 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 it has a uh, permission based it's it has a an option to uh, uh you know define the smart contracts that's the important thing it's not a, a permission is the public as well but then it's, it's it just operates based on these smart contracts so ethereum at a glance so it's again uh, it's an open source blockchain for dapps as in decentralized applications powered by smart contracts smart contracts you know you know you can define any terms and conditions uh, that's in a programmable language of course and it's founded by vitalik buterin and uses the proof of stake consensus a mechanism proof of stakes ethereum was using or ethereum have been using uh, proof of work consensus until this week thursday so very recently on September 16, they have just migrated or merged to the proof of stake consensus. And also it has a, this is the one uh, technology blockchain, one of the blockchain technologies uh, most widely used with a native cryptocurrency called Ether, ETH, E-T-H is a symbol. So um, the Ethereum uses the Ethereum virtual machine to execute the smart contracts. As I've already told you, smart contracts and the consensus, you know, whatever the data of the, uh, or the transactions that is submitted, it just the all the network of the nodes has a copy of the transactions that they have submitted. And in order to execute that in Ethereum, it requires Ethereum virtual machine, right? So Ethereum virtual machine to operate in every bit of node, the Ethereum virtual machine should be in every every node that is part of the network. Just like you have this Java virtual machine, right? That needs to be there to compile and integrate the Java programming. The smart contracts, in order to execute the smart contracts uh, for Ethereum, it requires Ethereum virtual machines that is to be installed in every nodes. So uh, this is an overview. So again, it's a fut futuristic open source, which is a public blockchain for, um, you know, that is designed to build primary role of the Bitcoin as a, you know, centralized peer to peer. Again, it follows the peer-to-peer -peer for every blockchain it just operates on a peer-to-peer p2p currency 
So uh, let's take a look at the consensus mechanism. It operates, you know, it works on the POW, as I've mentioned. I, as, I'm sorry, it's uh, 14 September, not 16 September, which is 16 September is yesterday, but 14 September, which was Thursday, I believe, uh, shifted to proof of stake on September. September 15th, I think that's right, right? Was already referred to uh, Ethereum 2.0 merge. So I have provided you the link. Um, so this is just for your reference. I'm not going to know, uh, take you through a lot of um, links. I think I'm not able to copy the link on uh, the deck or on the presenter mode while on the slideshow. But this deck will be shared to you uh, post the session. Uh, feel free to use all the reference materials that are provided here right so the shift in the pos as in the shift in the uh, shift to the pos it should be a shift to the proof of stake would help reduce 2.2 percentage of the world electric consumption just think how tremendous they will be they've been using you know all consuming a lot of energies in order to process or you know mine the ethereum so uh, world electric consumption is basically refers to mining in order to you know mine any blocks in the ethereum network they have to use a lot of electric consumption which is almost like point of percentage and for one single transaction it just uh, significantly reduced you know approximately 99.9 percentage of their energy consumption has been reduced so this saved a lot of money a lot of energy a lot of resources a lot of computing power but it has been replaced with the amount of assets that the miner own so that's uh, all about the mechanism consensus mechanism if you just go to the ethereum 2.0 uh, merge and you see the little url that is popping up like https slash ethereum.org this is the uh, ethereum uh, website itself <coughs> I just go to upgrade, upgrades and see and uh, read about the merge that the screenshot that I have captured is also from the Ethereum website that you know it, they've, they've been using the proof of red and now it is deprecated which means that it is not being used actively now it's not at all will be used in the future so that's what it means and if, if they want they can, they can switch back but it's deprecated not in use currently and recently switched to the proof of stake and transactions apps and contracts and balances everything has been already based on the POS or the proof of stakes concepts and with in terms of mining and smart contracts right you know um, now have an understanding of what smart contract it is i'm just reiterating it just the terms and conditions for any industry as a business model but you just define in a programmable language and feed into the blockchain system so with mining perspective you may think of like oh, who will do the mining and who can take participate you know who can participate in the mining right like we have three types of mining in picture. So one is pool mining, the other one is the mining alone, as in an individual miner, and the third one is the cloud mining, which is like the pool mining is refers to a group of people come together and mine together, and whatever the uh, rewards that they give as a result of mining, they just you know share it across the people. For example, ten people, ten miners are mining a block or a network of um, you know a blockchain, for example. And if they you know if five out of ten miners are receiving a reward, right? And that five people reward will be uh, kind of uh, you know distributed across the ten miners. And this is profitable when uh, you do not uh, receive any reward at all. And also this is profitable when you connect all the computers together because the amount of computer computing energy or the resources that it will take, it, it, it's going to be very effective. It's going to be super, uh, f uh, you know, uh, faster efficient and also it will just you know uh, you can mine it in a just a matter of few minutes compared to the individual miner because if i'm just mining using my computer it will take a lot of uh, computer energy and my computer may not have a huge processor at all i can do the mining process only at my computer speed and if I wanted to do more, of course, I, my computer will not allow because that's the max capacity. It's already been utilized. So uh, that's kind of a little bit ineffective. But if you are lucky, if you are lucky, you can mine alone. And if you manage to 
crack that if you manage to mine it successfully you don't have to share any rewards all the 12.5 BTC is yours so it's like uh, you'll be the top billionaire at the moment I think so that's profitable but that there is a very little chance and there is a, uh, there is a history that um, you know uh, in, in, there is a record that uh, a particular person just randomly tried um, you know mining a block uh, just like that and he got uh, and he got the reward successfully he got like 12.5 BTCs. Just think about it. What is the value of 12.5 BTC? It's like 20, approximately $20,000. One BTC is just costing to $20,000 at the moment. 12.5 BTC into $20,000. It is like a huge. So that not that's not happening anymore. Like it's it's so uh, the Bitcoin mining process itself uh, has become you know super uh, challenging and difficult these days because the number of blocks and the competition has been higher. So that has become a relatively in a difficult uh, way. So the cloud mining we have, uh, th that's the third type. You just pay someone else to mine for you and then they just pay the rewards for you. So you just agree, you know, you just pay, for example, 25,000 and whatever the reward that that they gonna get, right? And uh, they, they will be sharing the reward with you. So that's another uh, types of mining. And in terms of smart contracts, how it works on the Ethereum side. So a contract here, a graphical representation that I have put in here. So this is the very first steps where the smart contract uh, between the parties, two parties is written as a code, right? As I mentioned, as a programmable code, and it is now published into the blockchain. So individuals who are involved uh, in the transaction is completely anonymous. They are totally new to each other. So just think about the Bitcoin blockchain. I'm just going not transact or trade something i don't know who the person is uh, who i'm going to trade with who is going to sell or who's going to buy my money or buy my bitcoins so it's come kind of uh, completely anonymous you will not get to know them so you'll know only the uh, hash or some sort of a random identity code that will be provided to you uh, so that's that's completely anonymous but here the terms and conditions that are defined in the blockchain is completely visible to both the parties both the parties a and party b so that's very important to follow right so when it comes to the uh, second step a triggering event as in for example if you if this particular blockchain um, smart contract if you are uh, you know, signing of an agreement. Uh, for example, if I wanted to trade something and I, I wanted to sell my asset, uh, you know, uh, for example, one Bitcoin or whatever, it, if it reaches to 50,000 now, currently like 20,000, uh, the value of Bitcoin, one Bitcoin is $20,000. And I don't know how the future is going to be, but if at all, any case in future, if the one price of one Bitcoin is going to hit 30 or $40,000, then I I have to sell this. I want to sell this asset. So smart contracts know the terms and conditions and it automatically trigger an event. OK, this is something that is already defined. So now the price of the Bitcoin is reached to $40,000. I believe now I need to trigger an event to, to sell the asset as defined by the contract owner. So yes, that's 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 uh, the process that it operates. That's how it operates. and. Um, the contract executes automatically. There is no separate, uh, uh, you know, identity or there is no need of a separate individual to, you know, trigger something or maintain or switch or toggle something manually. So smart contracts, the beauty of the smart contract itself, it just executed automatically once the trigger occur. So a regulator uh, here, I, I have provided the, the third step. These are called regulators. So, so those regulators modify, you know, uh, keep on watching what is happening in the network of nodes. And then they just understand, OK, these are the things and these are the transactions that is happening. And then like I, I get to know or the fellow participants or the fellow system of nodes, they will get to know what is going on in the network of nodes. So this is just a graphical representation. I preferred uh, uh, not to put too much of a textual, um, you know, uh, concepts on the slide, but rather chose to, you know, talk about it, uh, uh, you know, from my side uh, during the uh, presentation. So buying and trading Ethereum and wallets for any uh, cryptocurrencies, if you want, if you re if you recollect, Ethereum itself has their own native cryptocurrency that's called ETH, Ether. 
OK, so you can purchase either via exchanges or from the Ethereum wallets directly. So wallet itself like it's just acts like a Google Pay, you know, PayPal and Apple Pay and etc. Just like how you manage your funds, right? But they will not have an access to your funds. So it's your money. Wallet is just to see and track and monitor what is going on effectively. Uh, you, if you wanted to use any wallet for your normal, you know, the bank, uh, the native uh, currency that we have, the stable currency that we have, the INR, you can use this these these number of wallets. You can just choose. You the choice is yours. Similarly, in order to trade Ethereum, the cryptocurrency, we were, we have multiple wallets as well. If you want, you can just uh, use uh, an Ethereum wallet itself. You can use this Ethereum.org. I'm not going to uh, dive in deep because uh, you just have to do your own due diligence in terms of buying and trading because it's yeah, it involves the actual currency. I don't want to play with it. I don't want to give any recommendations to it, right? So now uh, for any Ethereum, you know, Ethereum is not just a cryptocurrency but a po very powerful technology blockchain technology that allows uh, the participants to you know uh, operate based on smart contract and consensus like that so all these uh, you know i've been talking a lot about the uh, smart contracts but to define anything in the ethereum itself so they have a standard process called erc which is the ethereum request for comments so ethereum request for comments is something that is created by the uh, programmers in the ethereum community smart contract programmers in the ethereum community so that particular documents so that's just a document okay that that just the document containing the terms and conditions how an ethereum blockchain should work so of course every blockchain has their own terms and conditions but ethereum itself uh, has their own terms and conditions and how the other um, you know improvements can be submitted so they have the standard protocols needs to be followed so that is something that is defined as ethereum request for comments that has been created by the smart contract programmers inside the ethereum community so that defines the principles that ethereum based token must follow so uh, ethereum community here uh, this is the flow chart of how the process follows the if you wanted to submit any change request right ethereum uh, technologies is just an open source as in like you can also submit your own um, you know uh, ideas to them and if they consider it to be valid or if they consider it to be uh, you know valuable uh, they just review and approve them Right. So uh, if, if example uh, tomorrow, it's not just uh, Ethereum uh, did not be just operated a smart contract. I have a powerful idea than that. So you can propose that you can propose that any standard user who is a part of Ethereum community. You can sign up to the Ethereum community and you can propose your idea. You just uh, submit an Ethereum you know, request for comments documents via Ethereum improvement proposal is just a, 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 a you know a process that they have. If you just submit your document there or an idea uh, to, be, uh, to be, uh, keep it as simple and Ethereum community, Ethereum community as in it contains a set of uh, programmers, you know, uh, they just review the documents and also, uh, you know, come to you for revisions. If they, if they have, if they uh, wanted any clarifications, they just reach out to you for any revisions or clarification and ne if they needed more uh, information, Information, they just reach out to you to understand what your concept uh, uh, concept all about understand what your idea what you're trying to say and uh, whether it is uh, approved or whether it is valuable or not whether it is valid or not whether it is something that need, they need to change or incorporate it everything that they uh, that process eip and uh, erc process everything has it and they just if, if they if if it is in their favor or if, if if your idea is considered to be valid then they just provide their approval and you then go ahead and follow the implementation process to incorporate that idea into the uh, ethereum so the most common st uh, token standards uh, inside the Ethereum is something that like, you know, ERC-20, ERC-721 and ERC-1155. So ERC-20 is a standard um, fungible tokens as in like, for example, it just operates in the same way that if you have the currency with you, right, the cryptocurrency, you just buy today and sell tomorrow. And it, it it can just go hand in hand in future and it will not deprecate its value for that particular currency. It will have, of course, the overall currency value, but that can be reused in future. But what Ethereum request for common 721 says is that it's primarily for non-fungible tokens. 
right? They, you may have uh, heard a lot about the non-fungible tokens. They just, you know, create a portrait, for example, Mona Lisa, and uh, they just uh, create an uh, NFT for Mona Lisa and then send uh, or, you know, sell it. If, if that buyers, if if, it, if they just buy it and, and you know, they that particular NFT itself, it will not have one standard value. You can just, you know, make or set your own value according to the demand, according to the uh, value that it hold. So you define a price and this is uh, not uh, all the NFTs have a, a similar value. Each piece is unique. Use each piece is unique. For example, you, you can just create an NFT for PUBG uh, characters. For example, right? Each character has their own values, and if you, if you just create it and if you just sell it, if a participant owns that particular asset, then they just quote like ten thousand dollars, and whoever has that, if whoever wants to buy that particular asset, they just have to pay you ten thousand dollars. And if they, if they wanted to sell to another third party, you just give an authority to tell them that you can sell it, but only one person can hold it. It's not like many other, right? You, once you sell it. Then you will not have it at all. Like you just have to pay a different uh, amount altogether. But with Ethereum cryptocurrency, with a standard ERC twenty, every if if one ether I am oh if I am owning one ether, if you are own if you are owning one ether, so the value of the assets owning uh, from my side, you know, um, value of assets owning by me and the value of assets owning by you is similar because we are having like one ether and one ether both are having the same value. But if I am having owning one uh, a PUBG character, for example. Example, a character A, me, like I have a value of ten thousand dollar, and if you, some of you guys have, uh, if you are owning another PUBG character which holds a value of like twenty five thousand dollars, right? Like you have a more, uh, you have a more value of as your own. So that's the difference. That's the difference between ERC twenty and ERC twenty. It's mainly f focused on. Um, uh, you know, targeted for the non-fungible tokens. So, wherein ERC uh, double one double five, that's in the picture, but that's not commonly in uh, used now. They can this ERC double one double five. It's another set of token uh, type of token standards, which. Uh, is suitable for both the fungible and non-fungible. So this is not only the tokens, uh, or not only the, uh, this is not just three token standard that has been used by Ethereum, but it's the most widely used token standard, uh, token standards used by Ethereum. So yes, um, moving on to the uh, second uh, technology. Uh, sorry for the interruption. If you oh. can uh, just give a, uh, again, brief of uh, tokens, Kalei. Uh, ERC twenty and ERC seven twenty one. Sure, sure. Just yeah. a short. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So ERC twenty, ERC twenty, and ERC seven twenty one. So again, a token standard is something that um, you know, uh, whatever the terms and conditions, whatever that uh, you know, if if you want something to operate in a certain way, everything is defined in a token standard. So uh, there are uh, several token standards that are there in Ethereum community. So most widely used for the crypto transaction. Or for any money transaction or asset transaction are ERC20, ERC721, and ERC1155. So ERC20 is the most popular token standards that is uh, com commonly used, right? So it is um, something that is most used uh, in the ICOs, which is the initial coin offering. And then, so ERC20 is something focused only to Ethereum crypto assets. Cryptocurrency assets and Ethereum 2721 is focused or targeted for non fungible tokens. Non fungible tokens, as in it actually has a different values, right? So, fungible token standard versus a non fungible token standards. So, ERC 20 is just allows the implementation of smart contract, but ERC 721 it does not have and it's still in the EIP phase, I believe. I don't know if it is already in use, but I would say if you if your token holder, if if I have a non fungible token, non fungible token has I've already told like NF, NFTs. So you can just create a portrait. If you 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 create a drawing, right? Right? Example, and um, you set a value of that particular 
um, uh, so so you just consider going into an exhibition and you just uh, buy a painting over there right and you just create an nft for that painting over there online and you uh, assign a value to them and you just sell according to the price uh, or the demand that you have or it has or the value that it has so for example if i'm having a drawing of uh, 10000 or 15000 uh, dollar and uh, if i if if a party b has a different portrait of having a different value higher value of 30000 dollars then this erc721 comes into picture all the nft tokens it, is, it does not have a same value associated to it. But just very simple scenario, ERC-20 is just a, a common value associated to it. Consider one INR equal to 80 rupees, 80, uh, uh, sorry, one US dollar equal to 80 INR, right? So similarly, one Ethereum today, it's equal to some uh, $1,500, for instance. So all the Ethereum uh, cryptocurrency that you hold, it will have a same value irrespective of an individual, irrespective of the token assets. But in ERC-721 standards, NFTs, it will have a different asset value. So if I have a painting over there, right, I have a $10,000 value and uh, the party B, they will have a different portrait and they will have a different value, right? So it's all, all based on the value and demand basis. NFT-721 is for that and ERC-21 is for the stable cryptocurrency transaction. I hope it is clear. Yada, thank you so much. Yeah, a no problem. So we're in ERC double one double five again. It's it's uh, so you know what? Uh, as I mentioned, EIP and uh, some uh, developer, smart contractor, programmer, they have submitted the EIP for ERC double one double five. So they thought like, why do we have to uh, have this ERP ERC twenty and ERC seven twenty one as a different token standards? Why not we combine them? Right. So I'll just submit a proposal. And if I just uh, create a, a smart contracts or define a program that if it is a fungible, non fungible token, this ERC uh, double one double five will operate in a different way. And if it is a standard uh, crypto assets, if it follows the ERC 20 category, then it follows a certain another certain uh, way. So they just clubbed both uh, together and they it, ERC uh, double one double five. In fact, it just approved through the EIP EIP or uh, ERC process itself. So it's not something that uh, developed or um, you know uh, created by the Ethereum community itself. So that came through the EIP process and one of uh, a developer uh, like us, you know, a common man like us, they submitted and that has been reviewed outside of the community and then that has been accepted and they are going to be uh, used in future. So it is also in use now, but most widely in use, I think probably in future, they, they're just going to use uh, widely. So it's, it's a good uh, approach. So you can also, if you have an idea, you can also uh, go and be a part of community, submit your own ideas. Their community will review our ideas and then, you know, accept what has been valued and uh, valid and valued both. Um, all right, this is pretty much about it. I'm going to take a pause um, also to hear that we are already over like 25 minutes and also to hear uh, from you if you have any concern uh, because I have a few more topics to cover like the hyperledger fabric and the use cases scenarios as well. And the most important point that I have the bonus uh, topic as well like of why and how to determine the blockchain need. So uh, I just want your consensus here, right? The blockchain terminals, I would like to use the word consensus here because that's more appropriate and you can also relate in future. So it's not the consent, it's not the, it's the consensus. I would like to use a, con a consensus mechanism here to hear if you're all okay to uh, spend a little few more minutes with me uh, so that I'll just cover uh, rest of them. And if you have some more commitments, uh, commitments, feel free to drop. But then I would really like to hear your thoughts and inputs as well. Feel free to uh, post it in the comment box so that I'll also get to know.
OK, we are uh, hearing the responses. Feel free to type in. As you said, the participation, that's the important thing. Uh, feel free to uh, put your comments. What about Shantani and Priya? Any suggestions? Kishore? Can we proceed? I, yeah, Kala, you can proceed. All right, perfect. I'll just take it as yes and. Uh, great, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll just uh, start sharing my screen again. Uh, all right, so we are here in the another uh, blockchain technologies, which is uh, Hyperledger Fabric, right? So Hyperledger Fabric is one of the major and older uh, blockchain projects. So it's, it's not a very, um, it's, it's not, Hyperledger is not very different from the, Hyper, uh, sorry, Ethereum is not very different from the Hyperledger Fabric. It's both uh, falling under the same uh, blockchain technologies, most widely used blockchain technologies again. So uh, it's just that the Hyperledger Fabric follows uh, modular design and it is very much curated, you know, tailored for the industry uh, business use cases. So Hyperledger Fabric is the, private and permission while the Ethereum is a public one and Hyperledger Fabric is, uh, you know, followed, uh, it follows the identity management. As I mentioned that, you know, a lot of participants that are there and if I wanted to give any permissions, I have to know what is going on in the system, right? And as a, as a HOD of your departments, if they just, you know, uh, assign some uh, work to you guys and they, he, he or she has to know what is going on in the system and who is operating. And if any response is coming, you know, the anonymous like uh, we know what is the scenario and so the privacy and the confidentiality is also important because it's not like it, uh, the privacy and confidentiality versus the anonymity is very different the, uh, in, in other words, like privacy and confidentiality, as in the record or the data will be available and accessible to a certain list of people who knows each other, who trust each other, right? Well, the anonymity is just uh, primarily to, if you do not want to dis disclose your identity, that's when, and if you do not have any trust at all, so that's when just uh, those anonymity and those public blockchain comes into picture. So the blockchain, uh, Hyperledger Fabric blockchain, it has a modular design, and uh, the, which means it has a, a several set of framework and tools which which is pluggable i'll just talk about uh, that in a little bit um, well, um in a few few minutes and also it is suitable for enterprise enterprise blockchain solutions right it's very similar to other blockchain technologies it has a ledger and it uses a smart contracts and also provides a system by which the participants can manage their transaction so the smart contracts inside the hyperledger fabric it it is called as consent uh, sorry it was called as a chain code Right, so chain code and the smart contracts is very similar, just that the terminology is different in the hyperledger fabric. Right, it's it's called as a chain code. Where, wherein uh, Ethereum, it's uh, they are termed it as smart contracts, but both are same. Like you define the business logic, and you define what is the terms and conditions, and you wanted to operate a certain uh, industry or a certain segment within a business function. So you just define your logic and terms and conditions that operates as, as per uh, the way you define. So the important features that I have mentioned, like um, it, it, the Hyperledger Fabric Network enroll, you know, through enroll the participants through the um, membership service provider, um, uh, aka MSP, and also the certificate authority who's in charge to cert, you know, issue the certificate itself. And, um, you know, it also offers a functionality to create a channels and allow a group of participants to create a separate ledger of transactions. So to put it simple in a very simple way hyperledger for example if you consider uh, if you take an example of a hospital network okay so it has in uh, different um, you know 
uh, functions or a department of you know cardiology and ENT dental department and pharmaceutical for example and nurse and things like that. So in hyperledger if, if they wanted to restrict the data that can be accessible only the cardiac people cardiac uh, uh, participants needs to access they can create a separate cha channel for cardiology another channel for ENT department another channel for uh, dental department and new channel for uh, the nursing and the pharmaceutical as well right so one blockchain network but that has a different channel within them right and in another words in university perspective so if if, uh, if one single blockchain is maintained for savita university and one separate channel is maintained for cse department and separate channel is for maintained for it and separate maintained for csc um, i mean ece mechanical civil and so on and if a particular faculty wants to go and take a class for example mechanical engineering has a few uh, computer uh, syllabus as well, I believe. If I'm not wrong, I, I believe I'm not too old um, to forget about uh, what, how the syllabus is. Honestly, I do not have a view of uh, how the course uh, curriculum looks like, but um, I'm assuming that it ha they should, they will also have an exposure to uh, the computer or the IT related uh, subjects too. So if they wanted to give a specific faculty and access to a CSC department and a particular segment in the mechanical uh, department, they can provide the access permissions to both the channels, right? So a particular participant, not all of them, not all of them. So if I am taking a class to CSC department and also to MEC, and few uh, for a particular section in ECE, then I'll have an access to three channels here. And for few uh, who are completely into the ECE, um, wherein mechanical, we, we, if they do not have any subjects uh, in a uh, different department, they can set their access permission accordingly as well. So if they have, if, if in the hospital scenario, if a cardiac um, a specialist have uh, should have the or if a nurse should have the access to both the cardiac and also to an ENT, then that particular nurse will have an access to both the channels. So I'm just saying it in layman terms so that you can better relate to how the industry works, right? So in the industry, it just operates, you know, in the auditing, finance, and a lot of things is going on that uh, HR functions, HR business function, customer support, technical, digital, corporate, a lot of uh, business functions exist here in the corporate side as well. So as uh, separate channels can be created and a few participants can given the uh, can be given the access permissions to a spe specific channel and another set of participants can be provided into the different access permissions to a different channel. So the access permissions can be will be managed by the membership service provider. So this is the slide that I want. Uh, I am talking about in fact that I did not cover the architecture, but this is the whole concept uh, that I'm explaining right now. So MSP is something I mean the access permission is a defined and uh, uh, you know, defined and determined by the MSP, MSP service provider. Consider that this is the principle of an organization, okay? And they have in rights to assign who is the HOD and who is the faculty who can take it, you know, for the CSE and mechanical department. And they have the access permission. Certificate authority is something like badging session or section sorry badging se section where they distribute the ma uh, identity right they, where they can distribute the badges so uh, to you know identify or to differentiate the hod or versus the student versus the assistant professor versus the principal itself so th that's what the certificate authority uh, works you know that's how it works the certificate author authority it just manages uh, in terms of distributing the identities wherein the membership service provider determine and define the identities or the access permissions that can be given to the network of participants. I hope it is clear, but feel free to um, interrupt me and let me know if you have any questions here because it's very important to understand the concept of hyperledger fabric. Uh, if you if you are if you have an option or if you have an idea to explore 
uh, further in the future. Of course, we do have a lot of videos uh, here online and also have provided the reference materials towards the end of the deck and you can just um, view that as well. That has a very detailed analysis. Even I, I got an all the understanding and analysis and explored and got my knowledge through those sources as well. So I think it, it will help you a lot. So going back to the architecture here. So as I mentioned, if you remember, if you remember right, uh, the quick blockchain demo that I have provided, right, the uh, number of transactions or the data that I have uh, submitted and I have clicked on add pair, add uh, block and the blockchain or the test demo itself added the block and a lot of things happened. When I tried to change a data, it, it just throws an error message or it just changed the hashing um, the hash value of a particular block. It just changed in red and it, it was expecting me to fix right. So I if you recollect I was just mentioning that is just the whole UI of it, but a lot of things happening in the background. Right. So what happens in the background is that this architecture explains you all. So application is the software development kit is basically an UI level. Just consider an UI level. OK, so I have just type a, a test one. For example, you can just recollect that or relate that um, test one and I've just submitted on an ad block. So at the moment what happened is that it just uh, submit a proposal to an endorsing peer. So an endorsing peer is that uh, if you recollect, um, you know, the uh, MSP, a certain group of participants have an authority to validate and provide a sign of who can come in, who can, you know, add transaction, who can uh, authenticate the transaction. And there are certain type of a certain number of peers who are committing peer as in who are listening to endorsing peer and who acts according to the order provided by the endorsing peer. OK, so um, in the blockchain network itself, all the ledger or all the peer, uh, you would say it just uh, acts or have the similar permission. But in the enterprise blockchain, I think identity and access permission is very important. For example, you know, a HOD and assistant professor or professor has the authority to uh, provide you certain provide the students certain instructions for you to follow. They have an authority to sign or to determine the course syllabus, right? So to um, uh, to uh, accept what what is needed or what can we add it to the uh, uh, students activities and you all participants or the users of that particular department we just uh, simply have to follow right of course you can just to provide your own comments or feedback but then ultimately the order comes from the higher level management that's how it works in the industry uh, front as well it's not like it, uh, it's not that we have to blindly follow them a lot of a lot of scenarios, but then the committing peers have an authority to put their um, feedback or put their comments, but a majority of the notes needs to accept them as well. If one single participant just shout and shout and shout, that's not there's nothing going to change. And so in order to consider that needs to be valid, so it has to be certain number of notes needs to be accept that. Uh, point as well. So here the endorsing peer, the ones that data is submitted to the blockchain. So endorsing peer just validate and see if it is valid and uh, they just provide their signature and yes, it's valid. Just go and submit to the transaction, you know, go and submit the transaction and also uh, tell that I have submitted or I have uh, provided my signature because that signature considered to be a valid one. So that signature along with your data, it's, it will be uh, submitting to the ordering service. So ordering service is a determining authority like a HOD, for instance. Uh, so they ha they will be saying like, OK, this is like a valid. This seems to be a valid one. Let's you all follow. OK, do not argue. Just follow everything because it, it has been accepted by majority of the endorsing peers. So now that order comes from the ordering service. All the committing peers that is a part of blockchain networks takes the order from the ordering service and you know, update the data 
in all of the networks of the node, uh, node of the network in the blockchain. So it's, it's just a very simple uh, example that I thought I would just provide before you to better, you know, related to the real time example, real time scenario, uh, though the architecture itself uh, looks very complicated, but it's just acts in a very simple way, right? The submit proposal, endorsing pair, look for it and then, you know, sign it and send the proposal back. And fourth is that application US uh, SDK, as in the US user, submit the transaction along with the read write set as in the signature to and submit to the ordering service ordering service then cascade that information to all the committing peer and then that committing peer will then validate the endorsement policy yes it is valid valid the validate the read write set as in the signature and commit the block to this uh, blockchain yes it is considered to be valid everything is okay i'm going to add the block to, the, to my blockchain and then validate that i mean uh, commit commit that uh, data to their database so that's uh, that's all it works so it, it just applies to all uh, most of the uh, blockchain technologies that you may be exploring in future right so uh, having said that hyperledger fabric or you know it has a certain set of framework and tools it's not one single application but it has certain uh, framework you know this id uh, indi just provides uh, the um, you know identity and baro i think it, it uses the mobile uh, version mobile support so uh, it a hyperledger fabric is just suppose the web application if you want you can use it and if you do not want you can use your application of your own choice there is no hard uh, uh, hard and push rule that you need to choose or there is no enforcement or for you to follow a certain scenario or for so follow certain applications um, because it's, it's just if you are comfortable with one particular tool of course feel free to use it with the hyperledger fabric i have a uh, compatible version or an extension for that so that is how modular it is that is how pluggable it is you are uh, if you are familiar with one particular uh, modular uh, uh, functionality within the hyperledger fabric it's very modular you can just uh, combine that plug uh, plug any different tools of your choice or if you wanted to use any tools within the hyperledger feel free to use that and develop your own um, blockchain so uh, industry experts and the industry these days are following or you know uh, prefer they are uh, they have their preference towards the hyperledger fabric because of the modular design and because of the permissioned and uh, chain code concepts it's very helpful and uh, even uh, here uh, at legato health technologies we are using the hyperledger fabric uh, application blockchain application for the entities uh, under elevance health so it, it, it in order to access the access permissions or not the membership pro service provider and certificate pro authority to uh, so if you want um, you can use this crypto transaction explorer link to see how the blockchain transaction looks like in the online you know um, if you if you recollect you know this is uh, one one such platform where it just gives all of the uh, you know information about blockchain you know uh, particularly the cryptocurrency front it's not the enterprise uh, blockchain but the cryptocurrency that are available for you for you to use just imagine the number of uh, transaction that it has like 254852 842 i i was just uh, uh, you know I was just working only with the four or five blocks I have created and I had a hard time in fixing all of the blocks and imagining that these number of transactions coming in every day and if a hacker wants to, um, you know, change anything or tamper anything, imagine, do you think it is possible? Because by the time they are altering something, the future blocks or the new blocks that they are going to uh, add that is already added, they have to add this, those as well right so it's going to be very extremely difficult and complex that is the reason the blockchain it says like it's very very impossible to uh, it, it's it's challenging to tamper it's not impossible but it's very difficult to uh, tamper it so the more blockchain in the network the more difficulty for the hacker to hack the system so that's why uh, commonly you know for any new blockchain that is created in the market uh, people just initially started with storing a random data you know ensuring that the block size needs to be huge on and then we will just see or determine the uh, level of difficulty and uh, you know uh, 
whatever the stringent rule that they wanted to incorporate that will be decided in the future so yes the current blockchain size of the bitcoin is like 421 and here is the interesting part for example see I want to say this. I want to change this. And do you think that I'm going to change? What is the hash of the or what is it? See, this is very completely anonymous, right? I do not. I do not know who is this. I do not know who. I do not know who owns this. They are just transacting like 65 BTC. I'm just seeing and I'm just going. Just thinking. Just think from the hacker perspective. Uh, and if I, if they are just wanting to uh, hack this or just take out that 116. BTC why we just see like oh my four seven one four something that's a huge transactions that we have just I, I have been I have just uh, seen so far so it's like seven thousand something Bitcoin that is just mined and it's somebody has purchased so if they wanted to hack that you just see how many transactions it's it's a real time it's a live uh, data that you are seeing on the screen in fact so the chart here so it's you know you can relate how difficult it is right it's not you cannot do you have to super efficient you have you, you have to super powerful you have to super uh, fast uh, in terms of hacking right before the new transaction we created that's that's quite impossible that's quite impossible that's the reason they say uh, it's not impossible which is super challenging so ultimately the blockchain uh, cannot be tampered so that's when they did they came to a point that it cannot be tampered yeah so that's pretty much it uh, uh, in the interest of time, I'll just go through the industry use cases, how it is being used in the supply chain these days. You know, um, a very sm a small text. I think I have uh, provided a lot of information in terms of Ethereum and um, high fabric technologies. I hope it is, uh, you know, uh, you, it is well, in, uh, well clear and, uh, uh, you know, informative. Uh, coming to the use cases, the industry use cases in the supply chain. <clears throat> so consider like uh, a customer shop something in stores right so they expect uh, great prices great quality and great service on the flip side an unspoken expectations comes into picture that the product needs to be safer too right and you cannot you need not buy a product which is like picked randomly from any anywhere near the garbage so how do we ensure there are a lot of things happening in the market and we we do not know there is no transparency at all so just think about the food system it's very pretty com complex right it involves the farmers and it involves the processors distributors sellers and m many many more so the way the industry works today is that each segment of the food system operates in their own way uh, this is again in the supply chain management i believe it's 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 all the business proposals I have mentioned earlier. It's all in the papers, bonds, and documents right now at the moment. But uh, you know, and also they do not interact with each other because the bond that I am submitting to a food supplier um, and uh, the bond that I'm going to submit to a distributor is going to be a very different. And it's there is a lot of uh, uh, chances and opportunity that they you know tamper at any cost, right? They can change it on their own terms if they want. If they use the technology they can of course they uh, can uh, do so you can they can change the agreement they can you know claim that this is not communicated this is not in the document at all but in the blockchain they cannot do that so once it is uh, updated it cannot be deleted at all so you need to update it as in you need to create a new block mentioning that the old terms and conditions is no longer valid from today onwards from this date onwards this is the new terms and conditions you have an option to do so but you cannot alter it so that's the huge plus and we with blockchain we can you know make the expectation into reality also possibility to bringing all the segment owners into one standard distributed ledger and define them the standard protocols and the terms and conditions to follow and have them the update the process going on in the back end so if there is something uh, you know mishappenings like in a tampering or any updates in the terms and conditions in the future we know who is liable for that matter right so this helps foster the transparency and also what is happening to a particular product that we are buying fun fact is that china and uae i think uh, they are the early adopters of blockchain particularly in the food industry 
so that's they, it's good they're doing pretty good and in terms of um, so yeah diamond industry and insurance claim is another fraudulent sector that is a lot happening they just you know buy a diamond and they claim it is lost and industry do not have i mean the insurance company they do not have any evidence that it is lost right because there is no identity attached to the diamond and they have to settle the uh, claim that they have uh, asked for so the lot of things happened in the real time scenario and there is a huge loss for for the insurance claims and of course the mishappening is not uh, happening only in the customer standpoint of the insurance claims but both the sides so this would uh, help eradicate all these uh, loopholes you know uh, fix the loopholes and um, uh, i think it's it's uh, because of the immutable uh, immutable uh, nature it's it's very much useful and also uh, maintains uh, the data uh, consistent across all the uh, participants who are in the network and with the healthcare uh, the industry that i am working in right now it's a based on healthcare it's the largest um, healthcare provider in the us and uh, you you have you might have heard of uh, blue cross blue shield it's 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 a huge uh, network uh, that it has almost serving uh, uh, hundreds of uh, millions of uh, people in the us it, you know in order to increase the uh, insurance claim speed and also they they are aiming to uh, reduce the error in the claims and um, you know you know uh, what is the process the tedious process in terms of you know processing the claims you need to submit the documents resending the documents to multiple person and you know having an insurance is a good thing and claiming the insurance is a tedious process and i, I if you ask me i particularly experienced it after right after covid uh, when i contacted with covid seriously after the hospitalization i really had to kind of follow all the documentation process a back to back emails a lot of documents that they have been requested for I, I i had to send the documents manually to through the courier you know uh, and also wanted to ensure that reaches to safely to that particular person or the agency otherwise they will not approve my claim right so a lot of things happened um, happening itself and also if you are uh, doing or uh, sharing any pii or phi as in like uh you know person identifiable information person health information so these are considered cru crucial and in the uae and the middle east this uh, this is an offense that the sh you should not be disclosing the pii and pii phi information so that's that's another challenge here so with the blockchain uh, the data anonymity is maintained the data security is preserved the confidentiality is addressed right everything is uh, being passed possible in the blockchain and you don't have to resend any document to multiple person rather you store it and if you want you just provide your uh, you know view permission right you permission to another person and with the same help of the block the same blockchain data they can view and verify that the, your information is valid or not they can process it as simple as that so uh, this will avoid a lot of human errors a uh, lot of cost lot of documentation process uh, speed up the process more importantly very effectively and efficiently too so that's about the healthcare industry and i'm just kind of rushing up uh, keeping in in the interest of time also i just wanted to really um, you know mind full about the participants time as well i know i'm just already over but it's kind of uh, one and a half hours is very uh, kind of um, stringent and we as we have already taken a, a few minutes at the um, beginning of the session so that's why uh, i had to uh, kind of rush up so i'm so sorry for that but uh, to uh, keep it simple for the governance agencies here uh, i would like to start with an example of estonia you know uh, that's one of the most advanced digital governments you can even google right uh, you know uh, they are using the blockchain for banking for prescription for the medical uh, you know for even voting you know voting i mean for the elections i mean i mean uh, so they are just managing everything through the digital mode so which is like brilliant right so using you know uh, using the blockchain technologies during the covid 19 so the people around the world like struggling to make transactions adms are not working like a lot of like, i mean uh, a, a lot of things a lot of uh, shutdowns a lot of lockdowns even atms uh, were not working net banking was not working for a few uh, a few uh, uh, days like a lot of challenges that is there in the banking scenarios because the people are asked to uh, Uh, you know stay intact as in uh, within 
asked not to come out of uh, home so that that was a, a lot of challenge and even a uh, few countries the elections have been postponed i, I think it happened to, uh, happened in india as well so but in is estonia it, it it was not the case so they managed to complete or they managed to uh, process everything online because they already are you know in the digital mode it's not like india goes digital we are slowly slowly doing it we are already implemented you know incorporated blockchain uh, so that's the uh, i think that was a discussion in the last uh, financial um, the union budget as well i think that's the uh, important uh, point where um, our uh, pm has decided to use the blockchain in the government industries and uh, you know replace soon going to replace i don't think they're going to replace completely because there is a lot of um, scenarios that we need to consider how well the people are adopting to the digital uh, scenarios that's totally different but as an alternative means i believe they can still use it as an alternative means for example now you are using a google pay to uh, make an online transaction you can use the uh, we may we may uh, have uh, such platform to use blockchain uh, cryptocurrency for indian inr indian uh, currency in, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, cryptocurrency or uh, you know uh, storing it in the blockchain so that's that's a cool, cool thing so estonia is one of the advanced digital governments we can also uh, take them as an example so that proves that digital governance is already working well right so that's all it's 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 all thanks to blockchain again uh, i hope uh, the future is going to be um, kind of fully uh, technology as in like uh, it's it's completely no, it's not completely a majority of the industry is going to adopt blockchain like uh, how the big data and the cloud uh, was a buzzword in the early uh, 2010s i think uh, now it's again uh, it's it's an era of uh, blockchain i would say now it uh, comes to the internet of things you know how the data security is a major constraint now and um, the anonymity and identity of the iot devices so to talk about this iot devices right so uh, i would say i would take an example of uh, microsoft uh, ceo so he is not though he is an owner of uh, c uh, you know um, uh, owner of microsoft and a lot of um, brilliant startups and uh, yeah, have a fair share contribution of a majority of the technology uh, that is uh, there in the market in the world he's he himself is not uh, you know uh, not a fan of iot devices because of the data security and because of the identity um, challenges because uh, he knows like you know a lot of comp uh, challenges involved and uh, you know uh, uh, when you use your mobile and you talk something and the next moment the youtube shows your uh you know a similar ads according to the conversation that you just stopped so that's that's something that is a point of uh, concern right that's an area of concern that needs to be that should not be there of course they collect your data for their uh, services to be, to be improvised but what happens what happens to your uh, you know the other uh, crucial data sets or crucial information that you are discussing uh, within your own private place like at your home and if you are discussing some business professor and your device is still hearing you like 24 by 7 if it is on i don't want that right and i don't uh, people don't want that if it is a common citizen like us like it's not a major big of a challenge of course people or hacker is not interested in our data <laughs> so that's the challenge even if they are if they wanted to hack they can do so because of all this thing like if you have the um, uh, computer open if you have your system open you discuss the username and password i bet that information is stored somewhere in the cloud and if they they can of course they can uh, access it and hack it too that's a major concern here but with the blockchain and the inter internet of things that anonymity is preserved that identity of the iot devices can be tagged and they we we can even track for example if i'm just um, you know for 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 my apple watch i have an uh, find my uh, find my phone or find my an app, apple watch software installed and if, if something that i have lost it right I, 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 that's just lost forever maybe i can use the uh, find my device to track it but think about airpods it's still a smart device because it will recognize it is recognizing the moment i plug in my airpods to my ear the noise cancellation mode turns on and it's just listening to me and the moment i take it out it just stops that is not a complete iot device but it's still listening 
it's it's a smart device so every th that's a challenge here and uh, the data that is stored or the data that you are uh, information that you are discussing it uh, it is uh, stored in the form of uh, data in the uh, in the cloud server that can be easily accessible and readable right with the blockchain everything is being encrypted that cannot be easily accessible you know now you you might have a fair understanding on how it works and how what is the amount of transaction that is coming in you know if you see simple blockchain simple bitcoin a number of things is going on consider google consider uh, alexa how many alexas are there how many uh, google homes are there how many siri smart devices are, are there how many samsung uh, smart uh, refrigerators are there so whatever the commands that are provided everything is going to be added in the blockchain it is going to be tremendous so if they wanted to hack it's going to be very difficult so that's why so with blockchain again that uh, security confidentiality anonymity data security everything uh, will have a better quality control so uh, a lot of things can be uh, addressed the challenge this will be addressed and you can also think of iot devices uh, linked to the supply chain process to track the product and also to offer the correct location of any goods you know to without any interference so if needed you can uh, also incorporate more access control mechanism that can be set to restrict unwanted participant entry so uh, i thought i would uh, I, i i guess um, Uh, pretty much i have covered this is totally uh, you know end of the session that i've uh, covered a lot uh, that i already have uh, and now right i now i wanted to hear from you i wanted to hear i i really wanted to uh, see the active participations from the group of participants here uh, it's now the quiz time it's basically uh, you know i have just come up with a few four to five questions it's based on the topics or the uh, you know functionalities or i i just covered are you ready are you guys ready for the quiz time very easy it's going to be very easy don't worry i'm i'm not giving a too uh, complex too difficult um, uh, questions for you but it's it's going to be very very simple so i would like to uh, hear from you guys i would love uh, i love to see the participations feel free feel free to put in your comments in the uh, chat box feel free to type in i'm going to start the quiz only uh, when i hear the consent right when i hear the consensus right when i hear the consensus from majority of the nodes or the participants in the uh, uh, session today come on oh cool six responses so far okay all right i'm going to uh, open the quiz uh all right so this is the very first question is bitcoin same as blockchain answers please what do you think true or false it just, it just don't uh, worry about the uh, correct or incorrect there is no okay 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 nice i'm getting a lot of true and few false okay let's hear from others come on guys few more okay can we can we uh, validate the answer uh, to check if it is true or false anybody who wants to try please please take another few seconds okay now the timer stops and i'm going to great <laughs> interesting sanjay 
that's right that's the uh, i i really appreciate i really appreciate all the answers i really appreciate all uh, your participations um so it's not about uh, the right or wrong answer so uh, let's discuss uh, you know uh, whether it is really true or false bitcoin currency bitcoin is currency and blockchain is a technology bitcoin is an application of the blockchain that's good that's good uh, so yeah now you come to know so yeah uh, so bitcoin is not <laughs> the same as blockchain so bitcoin uses the blockchain as a technology right so blockchain itself can be used uh, uh, used in the several different uh, different application so bitcoin is just one technology uh, within blockchain so bitcoin uses uh, uh, the underlying technology i mean blockchain as an underlying technology so so the answer to the very first question is false okay but i really really appreciate all the uh, participations and let's move on to the second question dash is an example of blockchain technologies so is it a private or public ethereum or hyperledger fabric and c none of the above we just think of uh, the uh, blockchain technologies it's not a blockchain so there is a, a difference between both you know blockchain a type of blockchain and blockchain technologies itself let's hear from the participants so i'm uh, receiving a lot of uh, b answers come on guys just few more slides i'll be i'll be uh, finishing the session don't worry I, I i'm sure I'm, I'm i'll not take more than 7 minutes from now and this is my promise and let's just keep a timer okay for any every other uh, future three questions we have three more questions let's keep a timer for 20 seconds per questions okay um let's give another five more seconds if you want feel free to uh, type in your uh, answers Okay, let's lock. So the awesome, awesome. So the correct answer is B. Correct. So the answer is uh, the Hyperledger Fabric or Ethereum, which is the uh, example of blockchain technologies, wherein the private or public is a type of blockchain that we have, right? Public or private or permissioned. So Ethereum or Hyperledger Fabric is an example of blockchain technologies. Moving on to the third question: Who invented Bitcoin? Is it Nick Szabo? Satoshi Nakamoto or Will Smith. Uh, timer starts now. This goes up to thirty-seven point zero zero. Come on, last five seconds. Two seconds. Anav, yes. The answer, the right answer, is Satoshi Nakamoto. Everybody, huge round of applause again. Uh, so you all answered it right. You know, uh, it's not Will Smith though. <laughs> so it's just a fun time, right? Um, so it's good. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto is a invented uh, Bitcoin. And the fourth question is uh, who's, uh, which is the native currency of Ethereum? Bitcoin, ETH, LTH. What do you think? Twenty seconds. Fifteen seconds. Let's start at forty-five. I think forty. Okay. Five more seconds. Come on, guys. Amazing. Thank you so much. Brilliant. So it's ETH, Ether. Ether is the native currency of Ethereum. I I really appreciate your uh, attention and participation. I, I'm sure you are all attentive. <laughs> Thank you for that. This gives a sense of relief, <laughs> you know. Uh, and the last quiz for the day is the smart contract in the Hyperledger fabric refers to a chain code, B T A O S, or C application logic contracts. Let's keep the timer open. Twenty-five. Let's start with twenty-five and goes up to forty-five. Ten more seconds. Oh, you want to see this? Okay, sorry. I think I want to keep my. Okay, 
I think we should lock. Yeah, it's chain code. Chain code is the right answer, and it's not DAOs. I think I have uh, received a couple of these as well, but it's not DAO, DAO, DAOs. DAOs are decentralized autonomous organization. So that's a whole different uh, concept, and the right answer is chain code. OK, so uh, uh, brilliant. Uh, so I would really appreciate all your participations and I have a bonus for you. So now now you have a fair understanding of what uh, the blockchain is and uh, what are the type of blockchain and how the uh, you know uh, what are the blockchain technologies and we really have to determine the need of the blockchain, right? So we now have three questions to determine. I think the whole essence of today's session lies within the three uh, the next two two slides. OK, so it's not that blockchain is useful or you can use the blockchain to any different um, industries or any business scenarios that you can think of. Uh, but before that, you really have to uh, answer these two questions. I mean, sorry, three questions. I'm sorry. I think I should have chosen the current slide. Let's move quickly. First time it's gone. OK, so the very first question here. So you know, do you want the data to be consistent across the organizations or do you think that you know, do you want the data to be remain unchanged once it is written or how many organization do you have to do you have to participate? Is it just one organization or do you have many organ organization or do you have many contributing entities? Right. So if you think the uh, if you think the answer for the first question is no, you can skip the remaining two questions. Your business do not really need a blockchain. For instance, if the data is not necessarily to be consistent across the entities, you do not really have to use a blockchain. Instead, you can go for spreadsheets or documents. Suppose the answer is yes to the first question, but the answer is no to the second one, right? If an administrator or the participating authorities have to modify the written data at some point in the future, the blockchain is not an appropriate choice because it does not allow the modification of the data once it is written, if you remember, right? So in this case, the blockchain should consider a database rather than the ledger technology. So the final question is that if you uh, think there is only one enterprise in an organization that is contributing, if you think there is no trust issue among the contributing organization, the data does not need to be distributed at all. So in this case, the blockchain is not needed. Got it? So let's move on to the last one. And by this, uh, so with this, like I'm going to wrap up. Um, so the next one is that to choose the right distributed ledger technology for your enterprise. So when you when you think the need of the blockchain is determined, right? When you answer all these previous three questions, when you determine by now you will have the uh, confirmation, right? You will have an answer whether you need it or not. And if you think that you need it, the second answer or the second question you need to think of uh, which which one of the blockchain, what type of a blockchain I need to choose, whether it is a permissioned or a private one. Right, uh, sorry, permission or a public uh, blockchain. So, public uh, blockchain or the private blockchain, I think you need to answer another uh, set of uh, two questions. I have just uh, plotted down here. Do you think, you know, uh, determine whether you need an enhanced security or a consensus of multiple participants? Right. If you think a consensus of a multiple participants is needed, uh, then you just have to go to a permissioned one. So if you think the answer is no, in fact, you do not have to have the convince, uh, consensus of the multiple, um, um, uh, you know, participants. A business con uh, a business should actually opt for a different solutions. For example, a sign of participants, sign of uh, process, in fact. So sign of process, like you know, I just provide a sign off, you just go get it. So I don't need a blockchain because it's cost effective. So I it just uh, it just in involves a lot of cost. So that's OK, I mean, uh, you don't have to have the blockchain in place. And the second question is that what type of entities you have in your transaction? There is a group of selective or trusted entities or organization or whether it is a group of public anonymous entities. Right for the second question, if you think a business needs a group of selective or trusted entities, you might have to consider a permissioned blockchain like a hyperledger fabric. On the other hand, if your business think a group of public anonymous entity, you should have a public blockchain. All right, so this is all I have. I'm going to stop sharing and have for today to summarize what we have created or what I mean. Uh, 
created as in the blogs that we have just covered i think i have few links to summarize uh, we have covered uh, what is blockchain and its architecture and the history and the types of its and uh, the blockchain technology itself ethereum hyperledger and how to determine the need of a blockchain right so i hope this gives you an idea of uh, the technology and also i'm sure you'll be uh, very much familiar with the foundation and the fundamental concepts of the blockchain after this session if you are uh, actively participating and listening to me until this moment and i do have um, uh this uh i think uh, I, i do have uh, put in few uh, reference links as i've mentioned earlier i highly recommend for you uh, you know uh, this gives you a detailed understanding and also ask uh, your uh, professors to forward this and if possible uh, share the um, session training recording as well um yep yeah, uh, i open to question okay. and answers any questions and stop uh, sharing my screen feel free to put your questions on the chat i think it's it's, it's already a super long uh, session right it's it's uh, initially uh, scheduled only for one hour <laughs> uh, but it's kind of it's we are at it like late 45 46 minutes <laughs> <laughs> like, exactly it was a detailed explanation about uh, uh, blockchain <laughs> what is block history of blockchain what is blockchain and bitcoin and how uh, blockchain and bitcoin is related and about nfts uh, it was a total uh, detail and hyperledger the architecture mm-hmm. of hyperledger it was uh, so awesome uh, kale it was to- totally good and we i think uh, we enjoyed the session what about uh, you people any feedbacks can i get any feedbacks from you because she has uh, uh, spent uh, so much of time with you totally it's um, uh the literally it's 3 hours it's going to be a 3 hour within 15 minutes i want you people uh, to give a feedback so that uh, she will feel proud and uh, good because she is uh, she has spent uh, totally 3 hours of her uh, valuable time sanjay if you can uh, uh, mute yourself and speak it out it will be better sanjay yes ma'am it was yes, really ma'am. interesting and yes. she was patiently explaining ma'am so it was easy to understand Thank you, Priya. Here we have few comments.